So uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Eric Evanchik, and today I'll be talking about hopping on the CAN bus. So we're going to go into a little bit about automotive security, kind of how car networks work, how things in cars talk, and uh, then show some tools that we can use to automatically play with cars. Um, my background, I guess, I played around a lot with cars when I was in university, worked in research for actually developing some green vehicles. So we did a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle and some other vehicles. We managed to not blow ourselves up, which I find somewhat impressive for a bunch of university students dealing with hydrogen. But uh, yeah, we got to learn a lot about how cars work and uh, the security that's going on in them. So what is CAN? CAN is Controller Area Network. It's uh, one of the many three-letter acronyms in the automotive world. Uh, and Controller Area Network is a very relatively cheap and simple way to connect uh, controllers, so microcontrollers, with really uh, minimal wiring and minimal cost. So there's a bunch of different types of CAN you'll see in cars. Uh, you have high-speed CAN. This is a differential signaling, so it's got some noise immunity that's nice and uh, typically runs at about 500 kbps, sometimes a megabit, but rarely. Uh, Low-speed CAN, this is used for less critical things because it's cheaper. It's one wire, it's single-ended. Ground is actually the chassis of the car, so you just need to run one wire out. And you'll see this in like your light control, door control, like radio, things that are more, uh, you know, less critical and just more uh, convenience features. Fault tolerant can is what you'll often see in airbags. This is actually a pretty neat trick. What they do is it's high speed can, but if you cut one of the wires, it becomes low speed can. So it's, it's got some tolerance there. And the new thing is can FD for flexible data which nobody uses yet, but it gets around some of the limitations right now of the size of a CAN message. It's probably going to make its way into cars in the next, I don't know, knowing how fast the automotive industry moves, five years or something. Uh, and what does this look like in a car? Well, there's a little diagram over here, which hopefully is legible. And this is just showing that you have often a bunch of CAN buses. This is a bit of a simplified example. But here you have four controllers on a high-speed bus in green. So these are your more critical controllers. You got like an engine, transmission, uh, anti-lock brakes, as well as uh, your body control module. Uh, that body control module is then connected to the low speed bus shown in red, which is connected to some things like door controllers. Yes, there's a controller in most of the doors in the car nowadays. Uh, also an instrument panel that reads out your speed and uh, engine RPM. Uh, you know, there's controllers now in pretty much everything in a the car. They're just giant computers uh, to the point where if you have automatic seats that move back and forth electronically, that probably has a microcontroller that's likely hooked up to a CAN bus or something similar. So why might you care? Uh, hopefully you're interested in this stuff or you wouldn't have come here, but uh, in case you have no idea, CAN is used a lot in industrial control systems. It's used a lot in SCADA systems. Uh, you'll see it just sort of all over the place in, uh, in industrial because it's pretty good at being fault or, uh, reliable in terms of there's like a CRC built into the actual uh, like hardware level protocol and it also has acknowledgement built in, so guaranteed message delivery, all this stuff that industrial people like. But it's also in pretty much every car. And what I mean by that is every car after 2008 sold in California, and uh, sorry, and sold in the US had to have CAN. So all of those, and everything after 2005, it starts to phase its way in. Some as early as like the early 2000s, uh, Mercedes was sort of the first to use it. And it's a direct interface with these controllers. So often you're talking, well, when you're using this, you're talking actually directly with code that's running on an embedded controller that is also responsible for things like operating your engine or unlocking your doors. So clearly there's you know, some potential to do some, some interesting things. So how CAN works, we're just going to define some terms here. Um, first one is a bus. I've already said this a few times. Basically just a bunch of controllers connected together by CAN. It's a CAN bus. Great. A CAN frame is sort of a single data packet. It's uh, you know, sort of an atomic thing that you can send out on this bus. And every frame will have an identifier, a data length code, and data. So the identifier is just very simply, what, does, what is this message? You know, what does it mean? The data length code, how long is the message, how many bytes, and finally the data is the actual data. And if you draw it out, it looks a little bit like this. 
Identifiers, either 11 or 29 bits, usually 11. Data length code, just a four bit number, and then you have your data. And that's really all there is to CAN, is an identifier, a data length, and some data. And it's as simple as that. So let's start with like the super easy attack that is, it's so easy it's almost not worth mentioning, but it's sort of entertaining, so I'll mention it anyway, which is a denial of service. Uh, the way that arbitration works in CAN, so whenever people want to talk on the bus, everyone sends out their identifier. And while they're doing this, they're also listening to see what identifier is being sent. So if I'm message 500, or if I'm sending message 500, I'll start putting that out on the bus. But if I see a lower, mess, a lower CAN ID, then I will shut up and go into listen mode. Um, I won't get into how the electrical part of this works, but basically the lowest ID always wins and gets control of the bus. Now what's fun about this is that you can come up with a very easy proof of concept for denial of service, which is just keep sending a message with ID zero. And if you do this, nobody else can really talk because they get to the arbitration, you send zero, everyone else goes into listen mode, then they get to the next arbitration phase, you send zero, and this keeps happening. And like, this is really simple stuff, but it actually will do some not so nice things in a car. Uh, depends on the vehicle, depends on what CAN bus you're on, but I did this, uh, actually it was a company I was working at, it was the CEO of the company had a Chevrolet Volt, and we were playing around with it. And I plugged into it, and I didn't realize that the tool I had was sending messages when I plugged into it. And I think the actual message was ID 4, not 0, but it was low enough. And so what ended up happening was every fault code and every light turned on, like all across the dashboard, like lighting up like crazy. But it was a Volt, and the Volt actually has some great fault codes. It doesn't just have your like service stable track, service power brake, service power steering, all that stuff. That all came up. But then it comes up with, because the Volt's a hybrid, engine not available, which is actually my favorite thing I've seen a car say, other than the next line, which is service soon. So like, if you lose your engine in a Volt, they're expecting you to get to the service station before you, you know, run out of battery, I guess. But that was sort of a fun, uh, a fun message. I've never seen anyone recommend that I, you know, yeah, it's just the engine, it won't, it won't be that bad. Um, so let's take a look at sort of how messages move around on CAN. So we have an engine control module in this somewhat contrived example, but this is really how it works. I've just changed the numbers. Um, engine control module will send a frame, and it will be received by everybody on the bus. In this case, we are going to send it, or receive it with an instrument cluster. And what I mean by instrument cluster is that panel of gauges that you look at while you're driving. And in this example, we are going to decode the first two bytes as the engine RPM. How do we know that? Well, we have to agree on all of this beforehand. Nothing tells you what any of the bytes mean in this message other than you create a database called a CAN database of all these, uh, of all these messages and you program that into every controller on the bus. And now those controllers are able to say, oh, this is message with ID hex one, two, three. And I know that the first bytes, that's engine RPM in that endianness. And often there'll be like a, a multiplication factor or maybe an offset, you gotta add or subtract something to get to real value. But then eventually there's, you do a little bit of math and it actually has real world units. So in this example, I just assumed, okay, we'll just multiply by one, don't add anything, and we just get, okay, 5 DC is 1500 RPM. It might be a little bit more complicated than a real vehicle, but you know, it's just a multiplication factor and an offset. And once that's sent out, it can be received by the instrument cluster, which can display it. So this brings us to another really pretty easy attack, attack to do that follows really naturally from that, which is injection. Uh, we sort of talked about how, you know, CAN bus, all these controllers are just connected to it. There's no routing or anything. So everyone sees every message, and everyone can send a message with any ID. There's no limitations. There's no MAC addresses or anything. It's just identifiers. So it's sort of a, tr it's, it's a trusted network. They're expecting you to not put anything bad on it. That's sort of the assumption. So this means that we can do something simple like this. We take a rogue controller. Now, I say rogue controller. It could be a tool you plug in manually, but it could also be if you found some vulnerability in a radio or in the, uh, I don't know, the tele uh, telematic system or anything else that's on the car that connects to the internet. And remember, nowadays that uh, we're connecting more and more cars to the internet or connects over some other uh, RF link, uh, you, that's potential for 
one way to get in. But once you have control of anything on the CAN bus, you can do stuff like this. And we could just, you know, send a different engine RPM. What happens when we do that? Well, whenever it gets up to arbitration, both these messages are going to get sent. And uh, they actually will end up getting sent out at the same time. And whatever one has the most zeros in it will, like, that value will win. So if somebody sends zero and the other person sends all ones, the value received will be zero. But if you send it faster than the real controller that's supposed to send it, you can usually just take over and, and really mess up operation. So if you do this on a car, you get that, which this car actually has no engine in it. Um, we're just sending a message, and as you can see, it's like, okay, 8,000 RPM. That's fun. Uh, this is a bit of a benign example. It's, it's just a really easy example to see. But remember that, you know, cars are, there's so many controllers and they're making so many decisions based on this data. So if you can tell a vehicle, hey, like, here's some fake data that makes you think, oh, uh, an accelerometer is reading a very high value that might be like a crash situation, that could potentially have, like, a chain of effect. Um, cars do certain things in crash situations. They do uh, certain things in different operating modes, and you can, you can fake these things out. So how do you get on a CAN bus? Uh, we talked a little bit about two, you know, pretty simple ways of sending stuff, but we need to actually be able to send messages. And the answer is you'll need some hardware and some software. M most computers won't talk CAN directly. Uh, MacBooks don't have a CAN port. So you're going to need something that goes typically USB to CAN, there's also some PCI to CAN stuff that nobody really uses anymore. And you'll also need a bit of software that just can make this easier for you to send and receive messages. Uh, also, the software can often encode data into these formats. I mentioned CAN databases that define where all the little all the bits are and what they mean. Uh, there's tools that will take live CAN data and decode it into real world values. So you just look at, you know, engine RPM, temperature, all this stuff just shows up. Um, so with a little bit of hardware, a little bit of software, you can hop on, on a CAN bus. So we'll start with the hardware part. Unfortunately, a lot of this is kind of expensive. Uh, vector is like the, I don't know, holy grail of, of CAN tools. They're like the really expensive uh, company that OEMs use and not many other people because the way I explain them is uh, it's so expensive they don't list the price on their website. You have to call them and ask. Uh, Kvassar is another pretty expensive tool. Uh, they're also a pain to work with. Uh, moving down in the price list, you got Peak slash Grid Connect. Same thing with a different sticker on it. That's, you know, 250 bucks, $300. Uh, this one's not bad. It's got some support for socket can, which we'll talk about later, but it's not, not the best tool I've seen out there. Uh, it's got some weird issues with VMs in particular. Uh, there's the Ecom cable, which I haven't used, but was what was used by uh, Charlie... Uh, Miller and Chris Valsek in their uh, research, and it's, you know, uh, 150 bucks, I think, for that tool, and it just gives you an interface with, you take some DLL and you can write your own scripts for it. Moving down in price, you've got the open source options, uh, which include the Good Thopter by a guy named Andrew Ryder, which it's actually the Good Fet, if you've seen Travis Good's feeds, Good Fet, it's that for CAN, and yeah, it does CAN to USB for you. Only problem is you can't really buy them. Uh, you can get a board and solder it up yourself. Obiduino is sort of the same thing. It's, uh, it's an Arduino clone that was originally meant to be like a dash unit that you could read OBD messages, which we'll also talk about later, and display them for you. Uh, again, you can, you can build one of those yourself. And then Cantact is a tool that I'm working on, which we'll talk about later, that looks like this. Uh, and, you know, USB goes in one side, CAN comes out the other. Last one are these Elm 327 knockoffs, which are kind of neat. Uh, these do a bunch of protocols that is, are for OBD2. Uh, it's not always CAN OBD2. It's, it's this diagnostic protocol that uses like five different electrical signaling things, uh, depending on the car. It'll do all of them, and you can get these from like Deal Extreme for 10 bucks, which is pretty fun. If you just want to play around with it, like go to Deal Extreme and buy one. There's no reason not to. Uh, I recommend a USB one instead of a Bluetooth one, though, for all the reasons that we're discussing. Um, on the software side, you have the proprietary tools, but really, I don't care about those. They're expensive, and uh, we're focused on the free ones. So SocketCAN, CanUtils, and VCAN, these are some things built into the Linux kernel. Uh, you got Wireshark, 
which is something you've probably used for looking at IP networks, but we can use it for CAN too, and it's really handy. And then this CANARD tool, which is a Python toolkit that I'm working on that just makes scripting some of this easier. So let's start with SocketCAN. Uh, SocketCAN, it pretty much gives you a, a, a Unix network device, like a typical ETH0, except it's CAN0. And you can literally interface with it using, like, if config, and it's, it's great. You can even like do routes if you want to, which sort of works. Um, and once you, once you get that working, you can use the canutils package to use these tools like can send, can dump, and can gen, which we'll take a look at. One nice thing is that this is now included in the Unix kernel, or in the Linux kernel, uh, by default. If you install like the latest Ubuntu, this is in there. You'll have to type like maybe mod probe something. Uh, you don't even need that actually. It just, it just works. Uh, and then you can apt get all these tools, which makes it really easy to work with rather than, you know, you don't have to build anything from scratch. It just works. And so I'm just going to show what that looks like uh, just really quickly. These are simple tools, but I have Wireshark up at the top. I'm sorry the resolution's a little sketchy, but hopefully legible. Uh, Wireshark's up at the top, which will show us what's going on. And I'm going to use the VCAN uh, module. So VCAN, rather than sending real messages and receiving real messages, just lets you do it all in memory, and it's just a local virtual CAN device. So if I just do a CAN gen, VCAN zero, we'll get some traffic. And Wireshark will nicely present that, and you know you can, you can take a look at it. Uh, sadly, we can't see all the way across. But you, you will see the typical, what you'd expect to on, on Wireshark uh, data length. The ID is over there. <laughs> it won't let me get that far over. But uh, yeah, it's just an easy way of dumping, of dumping that data. If you want to do it in an even uh, simpler way, you can run, uh, I've resized my window. We can run whoop, can dump vcan0. And this is just going to dump out all the messages. If you plug a device into a car, though, and do this, you'll get a very, very fast rate of data with a whole bunch of real live car data flying by, and Wireshark's just a great way to be able to filter that stuff out. Um, so on the topic of Wireshark, it not only lets you, you know, see what's going on, but it also lets you do everything you'd expect to do with a normal IP network. You can actually filter based on ID, you can filter based on data lengths, you can put in columns for delta times to see time differences, and everything that you'd expect and you can also save packet captures, replay packet captures. So it, it's a really great tool. It's, it actually is more powerful than most of the proprietary CAN tools for doing the same thing, which is great because it's free. Um, and I've been using this actually like for work a lot because you can write custom CAN scripts for interfacing with whatever system and then just fire up Wireshark in the corner and it will just tell you what's going on on the bus at all times, which is quite handy. Um, then we get into some custom steps. So I started playing around with this and realized that there's a lot of little scripts out there, but there was no sort of, nothing I could really build off of. Uh, so I decided to build my own little Python toolkit for CAN called Canard, which is French for duck. Uh, Vector stole all of the CAN puns from me. They have canoe, canalizer, canopy. Uh, they also have the uh, candela. So they stole all those, so I, I was stuck with French. But uh, this, the idea of this software is to provide some hardware abstraction uh, to implement the protocols that are really common on these CAN buses, to ease uh, automating looking at CAN buses and sending and receiving messages, and also just to make it easier to share uh, these things. You know, if, you, if the hardware is abstracted and you have any supported tool, now I can give you a script and you can just run it and it works rather than, oh, well, you know, I wrote with this for Peak and it doesn't work on capacitor tools or whatever way around it is. So just by making something that's not paid for by any of the people who actually make those tools means that you can make it compatible with all the tools, which is nice. So what I mean by hardware abstraction? Well, really simply, uh, a hardware device is a Python class that has to implement four methods. Start, stop, send, and receive. It can implement more to do things like set bit rate, things like that, but really this is all a CAN device actually needs to do uh, if, in the most basic form. So a really simple code example, if you were wondering how you actually do this, is, uh, you know, 
We import some stuff. We're going to create a socket CAN device. So this is going to bind to the CAN0 device as a socket. We'll start that device with dev.start. Then we'll make ourselves a CAN frame. So that is a frame with ID0. That's the identifier. The data length code, DLC, is 8, saying that it's 8 bytes long. And the data is 1 through 8. It's not a terribly useful frame, but it's a frame. And then we can just do device.send or dev.send frame, and it will go out on the bus. To receive a frame, we just do dev.receive, and we get a frame back. And then finally, when we're done, we can stop the device and free it up for other stuff to use. So really with those four functions or four methods implemented, you can now write more complex protocol stuff and have it work across different devices, uh, which is what we'll get into next. But first, I talked about this denial of service thing. And I really like it whenever an example that does something, especially something bad, fits on one slide. It's, it's a great when the code does that. And I mean, this is pretty much the same as the last example. Only difference is ID is zero. We set the length to eight just because while we're spamming the bus with zeros, we might as well spam it with as many zeros as possible. So we just set to eight. We don't care what the data is. As long as the ID is zero, it's just going to you know, shoot out eight bytes of data. And then, you know, while true send. Um, this will send many, many frames a second. It'll totally lock up the, the bus. You will latch fault codes on every controller because it will say, I haven't communicated with the rest of the ECUs, uh, the rest of the, sorry, control modules in the car in the last however many seconds. That's considered like a hard fault. So you'll have to clear all those codes. It's, it's really a bit of a pain, but uh, it does work. In some vehicles, it'll actually just totally disable things. Like, you know, <laughs> it'll turn off the car, essentially. Uh, all depends on the car you're on and what CAN bus you're on, but it can do some nasty things. So now that we've talked a bit about CAN and just the simple injecting messages and sending messages at high speeds, we're going to get into the fun bits that, you know, the manufacturers don't tell you about, which is the diagnostics protocols. So there's really two main diagnostics protocols. One is OBD2, and one is Unified Diagnostic Services. Conveniently, OBD2 is a subset of UDS, Unified Diagnostic Services, so we can start with OBD and build. And OBD, it's actually uh, courtesy of the California Air Resources Board. They decided that every car sold in California had to have this back in 1991 because they wanted to be able to do smog tests. Uh, so, you know, they mandated it, and now every car has it. It lets you read basic engine data. Uh, the vehicle RPM, throttle position, vehicle speed, uh, math pressure, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, it's, it's all read-only, that stuff. It's interesting if you're trying to tune a car or fix a car and see what's going on. That's about it. You can also read the fault codes. This is actually a really great way to save money. <laughs> if you read your fault code and see, like, that's a dead mass airflow sensor, you can just replace your mass airflow sensor and then your car usually works again and you can save yourself a trip to the dealer. Um, but you can also uh, clear the fault codes. So when that little lamp comes on with the check engine, all that means is that there is some fault code somewhere, and this lets you not only read them, but clear it. And that's really all it does. Not terribly exciting, but somewhat useful for, uh, for just looking at vehicles and, and getting some basic information. Another important thing about OBD is that they standardized this connector that looks like that. Um, any car you get in is going to have the, the mating side of this connector under the dash, typically by your knee somewhere if you're driving. And that will give you access to a few things, at least one CAN bus in modern vehicles. Uh, anything past 2008, like I said, is going to be CAN for diagnostics, so it's going to have at least one CAN bus. What's kind of important about uh, those connectors, though, is they only specify some of the pins. The other pins, manufacturers just kind of do their own thing. Uh, back to the Volt, actually, it has two ports, one on each side of the car, but they conveniently break out every single CAN bus to one of those ports. So you can just hop on to any of them really easily. Uh, really convenient when you want to do data logging or, or look in more detail at those. Um, but, you know, OBD, it's kind of neat, but it's not the, it's not the big, like, big picture. Unified Diagnostic Services is. It's this ISO standard, 14229, if you want to Google it. And it defines 
a diagnostic system that is used by every automotive manufacturer. The reason is because when you take your car to a mechanic, they're going to use a tool like that thing up top, the snap-on scan tool, to take a look at it. Now, they don't just get OBD. They get another set of messages that's manufacturer-specific, but that manufacturer has to provide them a database. And this ISO standard basically says, here's how you're going to communicate for diagnostics, and here's how you're going to provide the database to the you know, people who make these tools. That way, Snap-on can build one tool that can do Mercedes, BMW, GM, all those, because it just has to speak one protocol. It's also really handy when you want to reverse engineer these, because there's an ISO standard that tells you what the protocol looks like, and you can just you know, implement it yourself. Uh, so yeah, usually you would have to buy a rather expensive tool like the uh, Source Ultra from Snap-on or the MDI from GM that can do this. Then you have to pay a yearly subscription in order to get those messages. And that's just a subset. That's just the messages that are considered for mechanics. Um, there's a whole bunch of other messages that are for the OEM that are way more interesting. But how does this work, this ISO protocol that everybody uses? Uh, it's super simple. You have a client like that tool. You plug it in. It sends a UDS request. And then a server, this is their ISO terminology, the server is that a controller, maybe an engine controller, maybe a body controller, maybe uh, a door handle controller if you have a Tesla Model S. Um, and that server will send back a response. That's it. Really simple. Uh, all you have to do is figure out how to pack the data, and you can send requests and response all day. And what kind of services are we talking about? Uh, they're unified and diagnostic services, but uh, these are, this is a short list. There's actually uh, something like 30 of them. Uh, these are some of the cooler ones, I think. So security access we'll talk about a bit, but this lets them provide a basic level of security. Um, it's really basic, and we'll show that it's broken. Uh, it's been shown to be broken a few times. Um, the routine control is a way that you could just run arbitrary routines on the controller. The idea is if you're a, uh, you know, servicing a car and you want to find out why a window isn't going down, well, now you can just actuate the window from your scan tool. You don't have to you know, just push the button. So now you can f isolate things. You can say, oh, well, the window goes down when I ask it to with, the, with my scan tool, but the button doesn't work, so the button's probably broken. Or a lot of things like that where you can just do diagnostics step by step and isolate little pieces. Uh, read and write data by identifier. This sounds pretty arbitrary, and it is, because these identifiers uh, identify everything from the VIN number of your car to, like, its, uh, I don't know, lookup values for the uh, engine so that it can do different, uh, like, uh, emission standard stuff to, like, everything you could imagine is one of these values. Uh, and you can read them, and sometimes you can write them, which is kind of cool. Uh, especially with things like VIN numbers and engine control values and, and things like that. And then there's also the memory access, which is implemented on some controllers, which literally just provides you arbitrary access to memory. Um, this is, in most cars I've seen, somewhat locked down. But with so many cars out there, and often these implementations being done by one company that hands it off to another company that hands it off to another company that finally puts it in the car, uh, there's definitely going to be edge cases with all this stuff when you start scanning for it. Talking about scanning for it, that's one of the things that was really lacking, I found, with most of the stuff out there was, you know, this is a, it's an ISO standard. It should be really simple. Like, there should be software tools out there to send and receive messages. Um, there really wasn't anything out there where you could just say, okay, I want to do UDS, and I'm going to tell you the service and the payload and do it for me. So this Canard tool, I've built that into. So what this does is, it starts up, imports some stuff, and then it's going to create a device. I used the, uh, the CanTac device just to be different with this one. Uh, this is a direct access to, the, to this board rather than going through socket can. The reason for that is you can sometimes have special features that aren't supported by socket can, things like listen-only mode and uh, doing hardware-level filtering by identifier, stuff like that. So, Socket can doesn't support it, so sometimes you might want direct access. Uh, then you can set the bitrate of most diagnostic ports. I think actually all of them are 
500 uh, kbps. So you set the bit rate and you start the device. Then you just assign a interface. You just set up an interface. And it actually takes over that device at that point. And then this gets really simple because we can just send UDS requests and we'll get back UDS responses. So what I wanted to do with this example was I was plugged into a vehicle. It was actually a Honda. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was my roommate's, or is my roommate's car. Uh, so I have to thank him for letting me plug into his car and, and mess around with it. I did kill his 12 volt battery while I was doing it, so I feel sort of bad. But uh, I wanted to play around with the Honda, because I never played around with the Honda. And one thing is, I don't know where to send my messages to. Where are the, you know, what, where do I send my uh, diagnostic requests to? I have no idea what's, what a Honda's like. So I figured I'd scan and try to get a session, diagnostic session, from every ID on the bus. And once I get a response, a positive response saying, yes, you have started a diagnostic session. We're good, right? I found a controller. And on Honda, it was really simple. I ran this, and it goes, EC response for ID OX70. So what this is doing is it's going from 700 to 800. I just know, having worked on these, that typically diagnostic uh, messages are very high on the uh, ID, list of IDs. Reason being that whole uh, priority thing, low messages get a higher priority, so they don't want diagnostics to be high priority. Um, then we're going to try to get a diagnostic session. So UDS request. Uh, I is just the ID we're going to send it on. Then we got the service identifier. 10 is the service identifier for a diagnostic session. Uh, the payload is, is really simple for this. It's just what session would you like. I would like just the standard OX1 is the default. And the timeout is 0.2 seconds. That's actually a long time for this, but... Eh. Just, uh, just to give the controller enough time to respond. And then we just loop through it and send all these and wait for something to come back. And that's what I got from the Honda. Uh, some vehicles, I know GM puts way more on that bus, so you'd expect to get a lot more responses back. Same with, uh, I believe Ford vehicles do the same thing. Uh, it really depends on the manufacturer. What some people have done is that uh, OBD2 port, they've kind of air, not air-gapped it, but they put a controller uh, that's immediately after it and let, made it so you can only talk to that controller. The reason is mostly because when people start putting weird devices on their CAN bus, things like these insurance dongles that Progressive will give you in the States, or Desjardins in Canada, or you know, even little data loggers made by who knows what company that might have some issues, the automotive companies don't want to be liable for those devices, obviously. If you're driving down the road and your car shuts down, they don't want to go, well, that was the fault of this little dongle that you plugged in. So what they've done is they've kind of created a bridge so you can't crash that, the entire network, just by you know, messing around with that first one. So in this case, I only saw the one controller, but in a lot of cases, you will see messages get gatewayed through that controller. So if you read an identifier, it might actually be from a different controller in the car, and it's just working its way through and working its way back. Um, so 740 is probably just a generic you know, uh, access, and you can request stuff from different controllers on it. Security access gets a special mention, just because it's entertaining. Um, whenever they set this all up, they went, well, OK, if we're going to provide access to read and write everything, well, we should probably secure it. And so they set up this, in the ISO standard, the security access thing. And it doesn't look bad in of itself. It looks kind of like a normal seed key exchange, right? You got a request for a seed. Then you get a seed back. From that, you generate your key. You send that to the server. It checks your key based on the seed, makes sure it matches. If it does, they say, OK, positive response. You're good to go, and I've unlocked myself. If it's wrong, it sends you back a negative response, and you don't have access. Now, this protects some pretty interesting things. Uh, this Unified Diagnostic Services is used to do end-of-line uh, configuration of vehicles. So whenever your VIN number gets written into your car's controllers, that happens over this protocol. Whenever, in some cases, whenever firmware gets loaded onto controllers, that can happen over this protocol. There is a uh, UDS service for uh, upload and download data and it is used for writing firmware. So if you manage to get security access, you can do some, some really uh, bad things. But this protocol doesn't look terrible until you start breaking down some of the assumptions they've made. The first one is 
the seat is fixed. Now, the reason that they give for this is that they didn't want to put the algorithm or the like some actual important key in every controller. So instead, they just put one seed in every controller, and you know it'll just send you the same seed every time. So okay, that already means one thing, which is that the key is fixed, and that means this is 100% vulnerable to a replay attack because you know just send the same key back every time. You don't even need to look at the seed; you know it's the same thing. Um, still not so bad because odds are, unless you're logging the bus while a firmware update happens or while uh, it's running through its end of line tests at a factory, you probably won't be able to see this happen. Uh, though some cars now are being updated over the air, so if you manage to log one of those, you <laughs> could definitely uh, be looking into the in looking into this. But the thing that's uh, really great about it is that both the seed and the key are 16 bits long, uh, which means you can brute force the key space pretty quickly. They've sort of tried to stop you from doing this by putting in a delay, so you can't just send like all the requests all at once. But it's not that uh, it's not that long, really. It's not something you can just jump in a car, plug in, and like crack it. But if you have access to the car, or if you've taken over a controller in a car, it's pretty much you know maybe a couple a couple days worst case to get access to that. There was some research done by some folks at the University of Washington that they actually went into detail about how long these keys are, how long the delays are, and figured out like all the worst case times and said like eh, this is pretty bad. They're basically just assuming that you won't do it is the <laughs> what they got out of that. Um, so why might we want to uh, look into these diagnostics? Well, fuzzing diagnostics basically can create a map of these controllers, right? So we did the automotive contr or automated controller discovery. That's you know a really simple example, but you can extend that example to automatically map all of the services provided by an automotive controller. So you could plug in and just request every routine, every data identifier, every piece of memory. Uh, you could request to do security access and figure out what all the different security access, uh, they can have multiple levels of security access. You can get all of those and really create just like a, a map of all the uh, diagnostic features on a controller. And that's pretty much the starting point to playing around with this because once you know where you can look, uh, it's you just start pulling stuff out. You can create memory maps, pretty much, of a, of a controller. You can take a look at, uh, at where these values are. You can try to write things and figure out if you need security access. And of course, you can brute force that security access key if you so wish. So the concept of just fuzzing diagnostics, uh, I think, is an interesting thing because the automotive manufacturers didn't really expect or didn't really care about people plugging into these buses, right? They designed the cars in such a way that they figured, ah, well, no one's going to play around with this, and as long as you know you can't remotely do it, it shouldn't be a problem. So one side is we're starting to see that as we connect cars to the internet more, you get attacks like the recent BMW one, where oh, they did authentication over HTTP, and you could create a fake uh, GSM base station and, and you know man in the middle it. But the other side is that you know, that it lets people potentially get access to these CAN buses and exposes a whole bunch of functionality that the automotive folks just never really secured. So most of the stuff in automotive security is like, oh, it's, it's just there and you can do it. And the reason is because they just weren't expecting anyone to track. So uh, just to conclude here, we talked about sort of three different types of attacks that you can pull off. The first two are Pretty simple, just sending messages will let you do it. Uh, a denial of service, which is pretty easy, um, you know, just spam zeros. An injection attack, which it's really going to depend on what you're injecting, but you can f uh, fake out a lot of signals and just really confuse a vehicle in, in those cases. And then diagnostics, which is pretty much just a giant attack vector that hasn't been looked at in too much detail in most vehicles, but looking into the implementations, even if the implementations aren't bad, there's concerns. And then once you go past that and look into problems where they've, you know, left behind little little things that were not implemented right, it, it could be even worse. Um, in order to play with this, you'll need a hardware interface. I mean, I got to promote my own, I guess, which is this Cantact thing. Uh, this, you know, 
open source hardware tool for, for plugging into a CAN bus. And you'll need some software. I like the Linux stuff, to be honest. Uh, Wireshark is great. Uh, this Kennard tool, it's getting better, I promise. Uh, but the idea is to make something where you can write scripts to play with cars and share them with people so they can also play with cars. Because automotive security has been pretty much security through obscurity, to be honest. And now that we can start to look at it and make it easier to get on these systems, we can actually start to have some fun. So that's pretty much my main part of my talk here, but I definitely want to move into questions about anything to do with cars, security, and uh, anything else you have on your mind. So over at the back there. OK, so the question was, do they share code for the implementations, or do they write their own? In a lot of cases, they buy it from some vendors. Uh, actually, it's kind of fun to explain how automotive code gets written. So let's say you work at an automotive company as a software developer. You probably don't write any C or any, anything that's in text. Uh, you might write some MATLAB scripts. Most of the actual development of automotive control algorithms is done in Simulink. And if you're familiar with Simulink, you'll know it's the graphical part of MATLAB, which literally is drag and drop blocks and connect them together with wires. That's how they develop these things. And that's what most of the people working in software positions at automotive companies do. Once they're done that, uh, you prototype on a prototype controller. So I, I kid you not, you take your diagram, you hold control, press B, and out pops like an executable, and you flash that to a controller, and it usually works pretty well. Once they're done that development process, they'll work with an actual uh, company that makes a production controller, like a Delphi or a Bosch or somebody. And working along with them, they can actually get the cost down and get it into something they can put in the car. But all the code for things like CAN, uh, things like the diagnostic stacks, they typically buy from one of a few companies. Probably the most common is Vector, who make the CAN tools as well. Uh, they sell stacks for uh, UDS. They sell stacks for uh, just generic CAN on different microcontrollers, all sorts of stuff. So the answer is, yeah, a lot of it's shared. But even more concerning, a lot of it is cobbled together from different sources and then like shipped. Um, any other questions kicking around? I didn't see that one. OK, the question was, uh, how could you brick a car? Uh, apparently, Charlie Miller managed to brick his car and posted about it on Twitter. Um, I'd say one of the biggest things is if it's a car that does have writable flash for, uh, for firmware. Obviously, if you, you know, write some junk firmware to a controller, it's probably going to not end well. Other things you could do if you start messing around with VIN numbers, uh, cars often have checks to make sure that all the VIN numbers and controllers match. So if you, uh, you know, start playing around with that, you could potentially stop a car from, from starting. There's a few other checks that the car does. It, that stuff's really manufacturer-specific, and they really don't like talking about it. But the immobilizer... Um, so the thing that actually makes sure that you have a key, those use some weird challenge response stuff. And you know, if you mess with any of that, if you screw up any of the, uh, the seeds for that or anything, then the car will no longer do a proper immobilization uh, unlock, and then the car won't be able to start. So I think pretty much any of those, but the firmware one is probably like once you break the UDS code, if, if it supports flashing, which Quite a few controllers do. You can just like yeah, write zeros to your firmware, and that's definitely going to brick a car. <laughs> yep. So it sort of depends what level you want to do it at. You can fuzz like a raw CAN bus, which I didn't talk about too much, but if you're someone I was talking to today was doing that with. Uh, with planes, which sounds terrifying. Um, but uh, essentially, you can, you know, uh, you could send, uh, rent or send arbitrary data uh, just in messages and kind of see what the responses were. So if you pick, for, okay, here's one great example. If you wanted to find where uh, the message was that was controlling something like your vehicle speed or that was showing your vehicle speed, 
you could you know, go through messages and send junk data until you manage, like, randomly through messages until you manage to get the expected vehicle speed to show up on a display. Uh, so that's kind of the really low level of you can fuzz raw, like, literally bytes. Then go going one level up, you can uh, do fuzzing at the implementation level of the diagnostics. So in that case, you can try one great example that I don't have the, uh, I don't have the, <laughs> I'm scared to do this on a real car, is you can just ask it, that routine control function, you can just ask it to run routine zero through FFFF. And it's going to do a lot of things. And you, who knows what it's going to do. The manufacturer does, but you don't. So, you know, by trying these things out, you can, you can start to figure out what it is. And something like that is something you're going to want to do, definitely with the controller on a bench, hopefully, and not in a car. But uh, as you start to look at that, you can reverse engineer sort of what, what are these actions and what abilities does that give me. Oh, I, I got the promote. I'm not good at self-promotion, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there's, like, a, a website there, which is cantac.io. Uh, there's, like... Nine of them or something left from my, I did a first batch of them. There's not many left. Uh, if that ends up selling out, I guess I'll make more. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of fun doing open source hardware for stuff like this because, uh, you know, a lot of this has been obscure and the tools were expensive. And if I can make it cheaper to play with, that's, that's kind of fun. Also, if you want to build your own, you can download the Gerber files and like etch your own board at home or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, depends what you mean by fragile. So the question was, I guess, are there risks to fuzzing the, the bus and sending arbitrary stuff? Um, I mean, you, the, the real concern is, you know, that, that's a controller that's potentially controlling an engine. And an engine is a very uh, complex system nowadays, mostly because of emissions regulations more than anything. Um, an engine has things like uh, variable valve timing that lets cams move around and slip. So, you know, if you start fuzzing stuff and it's expecting a message that it's using to compute some of these, uh, some of this stuff. So if it's expecting a message to compute something to do with how that engine's running and you fuzz it, well, you could potentially cause the engine to go into some terrible state. Now, the engine controllers are typically pretty smart. They'll do a lot of sanity tests or checks on that data. They won't just, you know, let you destroy an engine. Um, but in a real car, it can be, you know, it's probably not something you want to be doing while driving down the road. Uh, actually, for fun, we plugged in that Solus Art Ultra, the, the, that guy. We plugged that into a car, <laughs> and we drove around Waterloo with it, and uh, we were just like pushing, like honking the horn, and like doing all the. It was it was fun. You can you can hit the brakes actually from it, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it, yeah, it, that probably wasn't. You shouldn't do that. Uh, now that I've said that we did it, <laughs> um, but it, will you actually break the CAN device? No, they're you know they'll take the messages. They might overflow a bit. They might you know go into some shutdown state, but. You can't damage the controller. The bigger concern is what the controller is actually driving. Anything else? Oh, I think I'm good. All right, well, I'll be around. So if you do come up with questions, come find me. I like talking about this stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming to this, and thanks for your time. Hope you got a little bit of an introduction into automotive systems and how to play with them.